All right, welcome everybody. Today we have author Kevin Kurtz. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, Kevin was with us actually in October, um, the last fall, sharing a book, A Day in a Forces Wetland, um, which was really fun. So he has a new book, um, Fish for Kids, and I was really excited to see it. Um, actually, I don't know if you know this, Kevin, but we're giving away this copy to someone who is here today. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so you're going to be teaching us about fish and about your new book, and I'm really excited. So welcome. Okay. Well, thanks. So hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm, my name is Kevin Kurtz. I'm talking to guys because I write kids' books, and the type of books I write are nonfiction books. So I write books of facts, so books about real things you can go out and see in the world. Um, so far, all my books are nonfiction books about science and nature, and this is actually my newest book, Fish for Kids, which as you can tell is a book about fish for kids. <laughs> they weren't super creative when they came up with that title. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about that book. And to do that, I'm gonna share my screen and that'll make it easier for me to show you some of the pictures from the book. Uh, so it'll take me just a second to get that going. Do you guys see book covers right now? Okay. so. These are a few more of my books. Uh, like I said, the, I write nonfiction books about science and nature. And I've written quite a few books about animals. <clears throat> um, so I have books that are about different habitats in the animals that live in there, um, how you tell the th difference between living things and non-living things, a book that compares and contrasts sharks and dolphins. But this new book is all about fish. Um, so what is a fish? Like what? do all fish have in common? What makes a fish different from like a bird or an insect or a mammal? Does anyone have any ideas? Because they live in water. They live underwater, yeah. So all fish are animals that live underwater. Um, if they live underwater, how do they breathe? Go ahead, Kala. They have gills. Yeah, they have these things called gills that allow them to breathe underwater. So that's another thing I'll have in common. And another thing they have in common, we can't see it by looking at a fish from the outside. Um, but fish have something going inside their body, going down their back that we also have, but that things like jellyfish and insects and crabs don't have. If you feel the middle of your back, what's inside of your back back there? Does anyone know? Your spine. Yeah, we have a spine or another name for it is a backbone. So you have all these bones that are connected together that go up from your waist into your neck and up towards your head. That's called your spine or your backbone. And fish have a backbone too. So the things they have in common, uh, all fish live underwater. They all have a backbone. They all have gills for breathing. <clears throat> and then one other thing that can help you tell the difference between a fish and other animals is fish don't have fingers or toes. So if you think about other animals, is a dolphin a fish? It's not right. Even though it does have a backbones and it lives in the water, it doesn't have gills. Is a horseshoe crab a fish? They have gills and live underwater too, but they don't have a backbone. And then here's the trickiest, um, and I actually don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> uh, I, think, so, I think it's an axolotl. Because, axolotl, yeah, yeah that's not great. We had a fun book about those. They're, awesome. they're fun. <laughs> so these are salamander. They live underwater, they have a backbone, and they actually have gills. So what makes them not a fish is axolotls and other salamanders have toes, but a fish doesn't. So those are the main things all fish have in common. So we said they breathe underwater um, with gills. <clears throat> fish have to breathe the same kind of air that we're all breathing right now. Uh, does anyone know what that's called? Like when you take a breath, what is the type of air that you need to get inside of your body? Oxygen. You need to get oxygen, yeah. So fish 
all animals need oxygen. They all have to breathe oxygen. We get our oxygen from the air, but fish get it from the water. Um, and the way they do that is their gills are inside, right? Like towards the back of their head, kind of like where we would think our ears are. And the way they breathe is there's oxygen in the water. And then as the water goes through their mouth, it goes over the gills and the gills are like little rakes that rake out the oxygen while the water keeps flowing by. Um, and then there's holes in the side of the fish's head called gill openings and then the water goes out that way. So they're constantly taking in water, having it go out the gill openings and then they get the oxygen they need um, because the gills pull it out of the water. Where do fish live? So we said they, they have to live underwater. What are some of the habitats you can find a fish in? Any ideas? Like what are some types, like what are some places that you can go to that have lots of water? Oh, ponds and oceans. The po a pond, yeah. So ponds are you find on land, they're like, uh, have water doesn't very move very much and it's fresh water. The ocean, most of the earth is actually covered by ocean. Anyone else have an idea? What is that? <clears throat> like, where could you go right near you where you can see lots of water and it's, it's moving? fairly quickly and it just keeps flowing all the time. Go ahead, Callie. I think you're unmuted. Oh, um, in streams. Yes, yeah, streams and rivers. So there are lots of different types of habitats, <clears throat> streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, swamps. They are all habitats that have fresh water. And then there's also the ocean. How are the streams and rivers on land connected to the ocean? Does anyone know? Where does the water in, the, in a stream and river eventually go? Stream. So what do the streams flow into? Uh uh, ocean. Yeah, so the streams flow into, <coughs> excuse me, into rivers, and then those rivers will flow over land. So even though these fish live in different habitats, they're all connected, like all that water on land eventually will end up in the ocean, it might take a long time. Um, does anyone know what you call that when a bunch of streams and rivers all flow into each other on land and they all go eventually into the same river? I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can answer if you want. Um, does anyone else know? That's a watershed. Yeah, a watershed. So <clears throat> the things we do on land, because all these streams and rivers are connected, uh, can affect things even deep down the ocean. So if you litter and the litter goes into a stream, the stream will carry it to a river and the river will carry it out in the ocean. And then that garbage can collect out in the ocean where a lot of different fish live. Um, but if you look at the ocean, the ocean actually has a bunch of different habitats. So some fish live right near the beach where the water is really shallow. Some live out in the middle of the ocean, but they only live in the sunny part of the ocean. But some live really deep down in the ocean where there's no sunlight at all. And because different habitats have different kinds of food, uh, fish will eat different things. So Here's a few examples. <clears throat> this is a type of fish called an alligator gar. And they live in fresh water, like in lakes and streams and rivers. They have really sharp teeth. So what do you think they might eat in a stream or a river? And they get to be pretty big too. They can be like three, four or five feet long. What do you think they like to eat? Hmm. So I think their teeth might be a clue, right? Yeah, they the, have sharp teeth. So yeah, yeah. what would they use for sharp with sharp teeth? 
or what would they what would they use their sharp teeth for? Go ahead and answer. Probably, an probably a deer horses. So, may, probably actually not seahorses because seahorses actually live in salt water, and these guys live in fresh water. But a seahorse is a type of fish, and they will eat smaller fish. And so the alligator gar would be in the water, and they're just kind of like barely moving and sometimes little fish will swim right near them they don't see them and then they can grab them and eat them with their sharp teeth this is a type of shark it's a really big shark called a basking shark they live in the ocean all all uh, sharks uh, can only be in salt water but if you look inside of its mouth they don't have big sharp teeth like we think of sharks having in fact they hardly have teeth at all but they have a big, huge mouth. So you know what they like to eat? The ocean is filled with little tiny animals called plankton. And they're so small, like we can barely see them with our eyes. And there's so many of them that animals like a basking shark can just swim through the water all the time with their mouth open. And then it fills up with plankton. They can get the food they like to eat. <clears throat> so seahorses actually eat plankton too but they're really small. They only are like a few inches long. Um, what do you notice that the seahorse's tail is doing? Can anyone see what the tail is doing right there? Go ahead, you can just speak up if you have an idea. Um, it's wrapping around a plant. And I'm sorry if I was the one who wrote on the board. Um, somehow I got into drawing and my dad was trying to fix it. And he was like swiping around the screen. It's just on your I'm not sure. It's just on your okay, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, apologizing. Um, so yeah, you're right. The seahorse their tail actually holds things. And the reason they hold on to things is they live in places in the ocean where the water moves pretty fast. And so they hold on to things so they don't float away. But as the water's moving, little plankton go by them. And then they use <laughs> their long mouth like a vacuum cleaner and they actually suck up the plankton. So that's how they get food. So these guys eat the same thing, even though this basking shark might be 30 feet long and this seahorse might only be four inches long. They both eat little plankton. And then this is a fish that lives in the Amazon called an archer fish. And if you look, an archer fish will actually stick its mouth out of the water and spit at things up above it to get food. What do you think this archer fish likes to eat? And they're pretty small. They're only like a couple inches long. So what does it look like that archer fish is trying to eat? Tiny bugs. Tiny yeah, they, bugs. they eat bugs. So in the Amazon River, there's lots of plants that grow along the banks. And sometimes bugs sit on the, the leaves and the branches just over the water. And so to get their food, the anglerfish will actually take a mouthful of water and spit it up, hit the bug, and it knocks the bug off the, the stick. And then it falls in the water and then they can eat it. So fish can eat lots of different things. Um, just to give a few more examples, a brook trout is a type of fish that lives in freshwater. They like to live in streams and rivers and they eat bugs. Uh, so they eat little bugs that are floating on the water. And so most people catch brook trout by doing something called fly fishing. What do you think the fly is in fly fishing? Like why do they call that if these guys eat bugs? I think that they use like things that look like bugs to make little things that look like bugs and they put them on, but there's a hook in them. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because brook trout eat the bugs on the, on the surface, like if you throw a hook in with a worm, maybe you'll get lucky and catch one, but it doesn't work as well as putting something on the water that looks like something you want to eat. So 
um, fly fisher people will tie things to the hook that make it look like the type of bugs that a trout would want to eat. And then when they cast it out, it floats in the surface to get the, the brook trout to eat them. So these are freshwater was, species. Just real quick before you move on, I was just want to let you know, I was excited to see the brook trout in your book because that is native to Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania state fish. Um, the only trout native to Pennsylvania. Actually, I think it's a couple states state fish in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, they yeah, are um that's one you could actually see around here in our in our streams they are the native trout for east of the mississippi so pretty much all along the eastern like along the the eastern states uh, of the united states um brook trouts are the native ones for streams and rivers but um if you go fishing you might also catch a rainbow trout which are native west of the Mississippi or brown trout, which is from Europe. Uh, Cause over time people have put these other trout in the water cause people like to fish for them, eat them. The only problem with that is when you put these other fish in the water, it takes away the food and the other things that the brook trout need for their habitat. So there's less brook trout than there used to be because these other fish have been added to the, the, their, their native habitats in Pennsylvania and other states. So from freshwater, we'll go to the great white shark. Um, so does anyone know what a great white shark eats? Nobody has any ideas? <laughs> I don't know. I see some sharp teeth in there. So I'm thinking that's a clue. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like the basking shark. They have really big, sharp teeth and they get pretty big. So the biggest ones ever uh, found was about 21 feet long. So if you ever see the movie Jaws, that one's 25 feet long. That's not quite accurate. Um, but they do get pretty big and they eat fairly large animals. So they'll eat big fish, but they also eat things like seals and sea lions uh, with their big sharp teeth. And then I'm just going to share one other fish. So this is a blobfish. Um, has anyone, have any of you guys ever seen a picture of a blobfish before? I see shaking heads. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So if you Google blobfish, blobfish are a fish that have been voted the world's ugliest animal. <laughs> and Aww. the reason that is, is like, this is a photo of what they look like when they're actually in the water. But the photo people are voting on is <clears throat> um, a picture of a fish that was taken out of the ocean and it changed the way they look. And the reason it changed is these guys live really deep down in the ocean. So over 2000 feet deep. Um, and when you go underwater, like the water above you will push down on you. <clears throat> and the deeper down you go, the more water is pushing down on you. Does anyone know why that is? Like what that's called when the water pushes down on you? Go ahead, if you have an idea, you can unmute. Water pressure. Yeah, it's called water pressure. And the deeper down you go, the more water pressure there is. Where blobfish live, there's so much water pressure. It's uh, It can be around 1,500 pounds per square inch. So that's like having a cow stand in every square inch of the blobfish's body. So their body is built to be under pressure. And when you take them to the surface, like take them out of all that pressure, it's like their body deflates and they look kind of like a, a sad cartoon character because everything just kind of droops all around them. And those pictures of these poor droopy deflated blobfish are what got them voted the world's ugliest animal. But down in deep sea, I can't say 
this guy's pretty, but they're definitely uh, not as ugly as those photos look. But if, if you um, Google it, blobfish, you're almost guaranteed to see the, the photo I'm talking about. <clears throat> so there are lots of fish in the world because there's lots of different habitats. So there's a lot of diversity of, of fish, like, and we don't even know all the fish yet in the world because most uh, of the fish live in the ocean and the ocean actually covers most of the earth, like over 70% of the earth is covered in ocean water. Um, if you went out in space and looked at the earth, you would see mainly blue. There's a lot more water than land. Most of that ocean water is really, really deep. Um, the average depth of the ocean is about two miles deep. So because the ocean's so big and it's so deep, we still haven't explored hardly any of it. Um, so there may be lots of fish species we haven't even seen yet living in the ocean because of how little we've been able to explore it because we just didn't have the technology to do it before. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you guys ask me some questions. Does anyone have any questions you'd like to ask about that book, uh, about fish or about writing books or anything like that? Go ahead. If you have your hand up, you can unmute. Why do they call it a blobfish? <laughs> so they call it a blobfish because the, the first time they saw these fish was when they pulled them out of the water and they looked like a droopy blob and they're pink too. Um, there's this old scary movie called The Blob about this weird shaped pink thing that was destroying towns. It's all made up, but that's where I got that name, the blob fish from, because they were these pink, droopy, blob-like fish. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, because you used to, I believe, based on what I know from the back of your book, um, you used to work at an aquarium, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was wondering what your favorite fish is. And obviously, you have an interest in fish and marine biology. So do you have a favorite? Um, what would be my favorite fish? That's a good question. Yeah, it's hard for me to pick. Like one of the things I like about writing these books, like where I get to write about a bunch of different fishes, I don't have to pick just one. But um, so maybe just what, a fun fact, an interesting fish. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like what I, I do have some that like I, I always I think are cool and I like talk about uh, one of them is a flounder. So a flounder is a, a fish that you could find in the ocean off of Pennsylvania. They're what's called a flat fish. Um, if you look from, from the top, they're kind of shaped like a football. But then if you look from the side, they're like a football that's completely out of air. They're completely flat. So they're a fish that lies on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, <laughs> they wait by being flat, they they can actually change their color like the chameleon does to make their skin look like the sand or the mud or whatever they're in. So that keeps them from hiding, that keeps them hidden so that when like a little fish swims over them, the fish doesn't see them and then they go up and they grab it and eat it. But that's not the, the weirdest thing about them. The weirdest thing about them is when um, a flounder is born, they're like a little tiny baby fish. They have eyes on both sides of their heads like all fish do or most fish do. But then when they're like three weeks old, one of their eyes will actually slowly start moving around their head and it comes over to the other side. And then from then on, they have both eyes on one side of their body and the other side is the side that lies on the ground. So, <laughs> and those eyes could actually look in different directions. So they don't have to be moving the same way. Like one can be looking over here and one can be looking over there to see what's going on around them. So yeah, I think flounder are pretty cool. That's very cool. Does anyone else have any questions? You can feel free to unmute if you have anything. I have another question um, just for maybe some of our, oh, well, I see a hand up. So let's go to you first. Go ahead and unmute. What was the first known fish? What was the first known fish? I don't know because um, <clears throat> um, people have been eating fish for thousands of years and which was the first one that they knew about or they're like, oh, we should catch this fish and eat it. I don't know 
for sure what the answer is. Um, they might be able to find like, <clears throat> there's a type of scientist called an archeologist and they look for things that people who live long ago, like sometimes when people use things, it gets buried over time. And if they dig it up, they can learn things about what those people did. So they might be able to go to these like people who had garbage dumps basically. And if they find a bunch of fish skeletons from people who live long ago, that might give it an answer, but I don't know what the answer is myself. Um, so I'm wondering, because we have some kids here that maybe have an interest in writing. So how long <clears throat> does it take you to write a book? Like, do you just sit down and write a book and you're done? Or do you have a lot of, you know, revisions and going back and changing things? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So when I'm writing a book, uh, it depends on the book. Uh, but most of the books I write take me somewhere between two and four months um, to do everything I need to do. <clears throat> and these aren't big books you can see like a lot of them are pretty thin but what takes a while is i'm writing it on fiction so i'm writing a book of facts so first thing i have to do when i pick a topic like this is what i'm going to write about is make sure i know a lot of facts i can write about so i do a lot of what's called research um, so i take time to read books uh, try to find good websites on the internet that actually know what they're talking about um, Sometimes I get to go to the places I'm writing about and see them for myself or talk to experts like scientists who study these things like that. So that takes a little while. <clears throat> and then out of all the things I learned then I need to think about what am I gonna write about? Like out of all these facts, which ones do I think I should focus on and how should I write about them in a way that'll make kids wanna read it? So giving myself some time to come up with ideas uh, works best. I can't just like sit down and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna write a book and then the ideas come. Sometimes you have to spend days or even weeks sometimes thinking on and off before you get a good idea. And then when I write it, it's almost impossible to write something perfect the first time. Even for adults who have books published, the first time you write something, it's almost guaranteed to have mistakes and problems. So <clears throat> well, I have to, read up before I send it to anyone else to look at it. I read it over myself. And then if I find mistakes and problems, I fix it. And because I'm hoping that a bunch of people I've never met before will actually pay money to read these books. I have to make them as good as I possibly can. So I can't just read it over and fix things once. I do it over and over again. Um, some of my books, like I have some books written in rhyme and it's really hard to make everything work right with rhyme. I bet I read over and fix things that's called editing probably at least 30 times <laughs> before I feel like everything is working the way I want it to. So yeah, it definitely takes some time, um, but it's definitely worth it because if I do all that work, then I feel really good about what I wrote and then it has a much better chance that it'll a publisher, which are the businesses that make books, will say, yes, we want to turn this into a book. And then I also have a better chance that somebody I'm not related to will actually read it. <laughs> so that is really good to know. Cause I remember when I was a kid um, feeling like I should just be able to write something and it would be lovely. Um, but the actual writing process has a lot of steps and a lot of revisions and editing. So that's, that's, I think really reassuring for everybody to hear. Yeah. Even when I started as an adult, there's a part of my mind that's like, Oh, this has got to be perfect right away. And it, you, you have to be patient and, and give yourself some time and realize like, oh, there's going to be some problems, but we can fix them eventually. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So thank you again so much for, for, um, for being here. I just want to say one more time. I don't think we have any questions. I'm just checking any raised hands. Okay. So thank you all. I hope you enjoyed um, learning about fish with Kevin. I know I did. Um, we are going to be giving away this book. So if you are here in this webinar, I wrote down your name. I'm going to be doing a random name picker as soon as I log off and I will email whoever is getting to take a copy home and learn more. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It's fun talking to you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.